while there, just last year, we got a call from Aritas Uganda, an organization, non-government organization, and asked uh, myself and two other colleagues of mine if we could do a study for them, and the study was to ascertain the cost of agricultural extension, the performance of key productive sectors of the economy besides agriculture, and uh, uh, we already did the work and presented to them, so we are in the process of trying to publish this work. Uh, so, I'll just to give you an idea of uh, uh, where Uganda is located geographically, so that we are uh, together. So, right here is Uganda, it's bordered by <coughs> Kenya to the east, uh, Sudan to the north, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo to the west, and uh, uh, Tanzania to the south. So we are a landlocked country, smaller than most of the countries there. And uh, this is going to be the outline of my presentation. I'll give you the background of the study, uh, talk about the research problem, uh, give the objectives of the study and the specific research methodology that was used, uh, give you the results and some conclusions and recommendations from the study. So, as a background, agriculture is still a key sector for sustainable development and poverty reduction in Uganda. Uh, it employs about 72% of the population, and uh, uh, the reports so far show that it led to reduction of poverty from about 53.2% in 2006 to 19.6% uh, in 2013. But again, uh, the, some reports show that Due to drought in 2017, poverty actually rose to about 27%. But again, uh, the results show that poverty is likely to continue because of the drought we have not yet stabilized, and also our gradual growth has, of course, went down. It's about 1.5% now, yet the population growth rate is about 3.3%. What needs to happen is we need agricultural productivity to actually increase faster than the agricultural growth rate in order for the poverty rates to go down. How are we going to do this? You know, there are so many ingredients for agricultural productivity to increase, one of which is actually provision of agricultural extension services. And that is the main focus of this uh, discussion and our presentation. So specifically, we wanted to explore are there any linkages between agriculture extension and other sectors of the economy. And these sectors specifically that we ventured into were the health sector, the trade and industry, and the water and environment. In order for us to be able to justify the different investments that should be going into agriculture extension, we already know it's very important for increasing productivity. But are there other linkages to other sectors of the economy? So let me look at briefly the developments and evolution of agriculture extension in Uganda. Uh, it's been moving from uh, centralized or government provided to private and now it is back to uh, government uh, provision. And what happened from independence, that's about uh, 1960, Uganda adopted a train and visit a system, but this was not really uh, feasible uh, because of physical challenges. So what happened by 2000, there was a new model that was introduced, and the new model was called NATS, National Agricultural Advisory Services. When this was introduced, it was a, uh, the PMF uh, poverty, mm, uh, it was the PMF framework for poverty eradication, and what it was supposed to do was to help strengthen farmer capacity to demand for services from the different uh, extension agents. However, the mechanism that was actually used to implement this uh, private provision of advisory services was uh, not the correct method, and of course things didn't go very well. It was also politically captured, and it lacked ownership. It was not uh, anchored in any of the ministries. So it became very difficult to, to follow up what was going on. So in September 2015, uh, they came up with a single spine extension system, and uh, which was supposed to address the public outcry by the farmers, and also the lack of adequate extension services because 
previously you, the farmer had to demand for them. Okay? So what this single spine extension system is supposed to do, it's supposed to provide technical uh, support. At the same time, the nuts is supposed to provide a role of just giving out their inputs to the farmers. So agriculture extension in Uganda, why does it matter? Why it matters? Of course, we know it provides information and technology transfer, which basically is supposed to encourage farmers to use high quality inputs. For example, uh, high quality you know, seeds, okay? It's supposed to encourage farmers to be aware of the quality of whatever they produce, especially to address issues of food safety and value addition. Also, uh, we know that agriculture extension helps to increase agricultural productivity. How does it do so? It increases farmers' knowledge of the uh, different agricultural technologies. Also, it ensures the proper use of these technologies that they receive. The other aim is to increase trade volumes. This is extremely important because then we can be able to reduce the gap, the balance of payments gap, and also increase the value addition and employment. Again, that ensures that the products that are going out of the country uh, meet the standards, the international standards. This helps to improve the terms of trade. Again, the other important function of agriculture extension is to reduce the negative externalities, especially the disease burden, as we shall see uh, in the later slides, how it does so. Now we know extension is important, but what is the exact problem, okay? Uh, we have issues with our agriculture extension. Uh, Uganda's farmers access only 12%, which is a very low uh, percentage. That is, there are about 1,200 extension officers, and most of them actually in administration. And again, most of them focus on the crop enterprise, but we know that there are many other enterprises. There's the animal husbandry enterprises, fisheries, but right now most of them actually focus on the crop enterprise, leaving the animal enterprise unattended to and leaving it to the private sector. We also know that these access, uh, access efforts are limited by resources due to limited financing. Uh, of course, that takes us directly to what's going on now. There's less investment in our project extension by both the government and also other um, bodies. Why is it so? We know that extension is a public good, okay? Because it's a public good, uh, extension does not have political gains. Most of the time when the politicians go down to the grassroots, Okay? They cannot uh, immediately tell the farmers that I was able to encourage, for example, or attract funding that help to in increase your productivity. It's very difficult for them to, to uh, own that. Okay? So it does not have those political gains. Uh, benefits from agriculture extension are also indirect human beings. And there is, of course, the issue of bounded rationality of these political uh, policy makers, that is, they have most of the time the limited information. Why is there limited information? It's because there has been limited research that is supposed to quantify the benefits, the economic benefits of agriculture extension. And the reason actually this study was conducted, there are very few limited studies that value agriculture extension in generating positive externalities, not just for agriculture, but to other sectors. For example, uh, we have uh, um, health, we have trade and industry, water and environment. So we don't know what are the spillover effects from agriculture extension to these other sectors that could be used to actually uh, improve the overall economy. So that was the, the reason this, actually, this study was uh, initiated. What were the objectives of the study? One, to provide an overview of agriculture extension in Uganda. Second, to identify gaps and areas of advocacy in the laws and policies that are governing extension, service delivery in Uganda, uh, to document the linkages between agriculture extension and the performance of these other uh, sectors. Uh, the fourth uh, research objective was to document the analytical trends between the performance areas of, of these selected sectors, which are health, trade and industry, water and environment, and the performance of agriculture extension delivery. 
and then fi uh, finally to establish the value of each shilling or the dollar invested in a patch extension or the cost of not investing this shilling or this dollar in a patch extension. So this hopefully will be able to, to um, encourage those who, the government and all others who would like to invest in agriculture to see that in fact, if they invested this much of this dollar or this shilling, this is how much it's going to influence the rest of the sectors and the agriculture sector in particular. So these are the research questions that we asked going forward. What are the specific developments in agriculture extension in Uganda? Okay. Second, are there any gaps and opportunities for advocacy in policies and laws that govern agriculture extension? Thirdly, what are the existing linkages between agriculture extension and the performance of at least three sectors in the economy? The health, trade and industry, uh, water and environment. But is there even evidence of the impact of, of agriculture extension and the performance of these other different sectors? Uh, the next one is what is the value of a shilling invested in a patch extension relative to these other sectors? And lastly, are there any trade-offs okay, for not investing in, the, in a patch extension given other sectors? Okay, so what is the methodology we used? Basically, we applied the mixed methods where we used both qualitative and quantitative data, but mostly our data came from second resources. For qualitative data, we reviewed the policy documents in place. We looked at the published reports from government, research institutions, and the different think tanks. Uh, we looked at working paper series from different international organizations. Uh, for example, IFPRI, EPRC, IITA, and other CGIAR group. And then we also looked at some referred journal articles. Uh, for the quantitative data, we actually uh, obtained this from the Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industries and Fisheries. We also got uh, some of the data from uh, Bank of Uganda, some of the data from Ministry of Finance, and some of the data from uh, Uganda Bureau of Statistics. For the expenditure data, uh, we was also obtained from uh, other different ministries. And then we had the Ministry of Trade and Industry providing us the export quantities and the import quantities. And also we have uh, annual surveys. So we obtained some of the data, quantitative data we used from household surveys. So what were the results? Immediately from just uh, reviewing these documents, what we were able to see was the, the effect of NADS on agriculture extension. When NADS was introduced, we immediately saw the, uh, the government sources, government provision of a project extension went down. Uh, this is running from 2014 to about 2015. There was a general decline in the provision of a project extension by government uh, sources. When we looked at the private sources initially from 2014 to about 2009, we had a decline, but afterwards, actually there was an increase. And this is specifically from, for the crop enterprise, okay? When we looked at the NGOs, um, there was a sharp increase right from 2014 to 20, 2004 to 2015. Uh, farmer group sources where farmers come in groups and uh, extension agents come to talk to them, there was a sharp decline, okay? Because this was not something that was advocated for. When we look at the animal husbandry side, what we saw was, again, government provision of extension services. Uh, there was a gentle decline, and then from 2004 to about 2009, then a sharp decline uh, after that uh, to 2015. Our data that we obtained was going up to 2015. So the NGOs and CBOs had, uh, there was a general increase up to around 2008, then a general decline. Again, we shall be able to see what were the reasons why this increase and decrease. And then when you looked at the private sector, uh, there was a general decrease, then an increase from 2009 to about 2015. And then again, the farmer groups uh, provision really declined completely. 
and we shall see how this affected actually uh, the society. So to answer the objective of if there are any gaps and opportunities for advocacy in policies and laws, government and party extension, what we are able to find was that these policies actually, most of the policies are in place, except a few that I will identify. And most of these policies really, uh, their focus was on increasing agricultural productivity. Examples of these policies are economic recovery uh, program that uh, was initiated uh, uh, in 1987. Uh, the other is the Poverty Eradication Action Plan, which was referred to as PIP, uh, uh, that was initiated in 1997, revised in 2000, and there was the Plan for Modernization of Agriculture. Uh, that is, it was the PIP framework. Uh, but what we see is all these policies required that government has significant investments. Okay. The other uh, uh, gap you could say is that there was the Maputo Declaration. This is where uh, uh, the African governments uh, pledged that they would contribute 10% uh, to the uh, agricultural sector by 2015. Specifically for Uganda, this did not happen. Uh, the other policies that have been in place uh, there is agricultural extension policy. This is a national agricultural pl uh, policy that started in 2013, and the main objective is really increasing agricultural productivity and more so bringing uh, into perspective the, the role extension work is doing. The other one is agriculture sector strategic plan, which is supposed to run from 2015, 2016 up to 2019-2020. The focus is on commercial crops and specifically crops that are of, in, of national interest. So what they did was to identify for each region which should be the focus crop, okay? And again, they're looking at the comparative advantage here. And uh, there is now the National Patch Extension Policy uh, that uh, took effect in 2016. This is where now we are actually trying to retool and reskill this extension workers and again, more of them are being brought back into the system because if you remember initially, the, the, when the system was changed from private to uh, from public to private then back to uh, public, there was that gap where extension workers were not recruited. So now this is emphasizing the recruitment of these extension workers and ensuring that the, the ratio of an extension worker to uh, uh, the household is about one to five hundred. Right now it's about one to five thousand. So that is the main aim of this extension policy. So we can see there are some opportunities, there are some gaps here. Maybe if this had been followed up, maybe things would be different. Okay? But now to going to this, the, the third objective and the question that was asked is what are the existing linkages between agriculture extension or agriculture with other sectors of the economy? And uh, when, when we just look at health, we see that uh, agriculture increased food security and nutrition of households, okay? We all know how. However, on the other hand, there are negative uh, externalities or negative effects of agriculture on health. One of them is diseases transmitted from animals to humans. Again, we shall see a chart where it is evident that if agriculture extension is not done properly, there is this transmission of diseases from animals to humans. Examples include brucellosis, avian flu, among others. Uh, the other negative effect is illnesses resulting from aflatoxin due to poor storage of grains. If these extension workers do not actually teach the farmers how they should best uh, uh, store their grains, they end up with uh, uh, aflatoxins that could lead to other diseases. Then we have illnesses and diseases from malaria. If, for, for example, the farmers are not told that they need to make sure that uh, the bushes around their homes are cleared, there are no stagnant water, you end up the, uh, with, the, with the illnesses such as malaria. Then, of course, there's pesticide poisoning. This is where if farmers are using pest, pesticides to, uh, for, to control their pests, and they're not using the, the pesticides responsibly, then we end up with pesticide poisoning. That is a negative effect on agriculture or health. When we look at the linkage between agriculture and trade and industry, 
we see obviously that if agriculture is doing very well, productivity is high, there is increased, uh, increased market participation by both the farmers because they have so much volume of output to take to the market. And then there is increased foreign currency through exports of agro products. And then supplies food grains to industry to facilitate absorption of labor in the industry. And then supplies the input such as cotton, tea, <coughs> coffee uh, to agro based industries and the reduces fluctuations of agro production that may affect the corporate investment decisions uh, through the impact of tra on the trade. Okay, about water and environment. We see that through agroforestry, this can help to improve the air quality of the environment. And again, when there is improper use of pesticides, this is going to destroy water and soils, hence polluting the environment. Uh, land degradation methods such as over cultivation of the land destroys the environment, then there is increased greenhouse gases due to again uh, agriculture. But is there evidence of any of the things happening? Is there evidence of the impact of agriculture extension uh, on the performance of these sectors that we have, we've just seen the linkages? Okay, so when we just look at agriculture extension and health, specifically the food and nutrition security, there is evidence to show that if a household is food insecure, if a household is nutrition insecure, there is increased susceptibility to infection, uh, there is impaired child development and increased mortality rates. Okay? Studies have shown that just malnutrition on the global scale uh, could be as high as about three US dollar three point five trillion per year, which translates to about five hundred US dollars per individual. From this, about forty five percent can be attributed to malnutrition or to poor nutrition, could be malnutrition, could be overnutrition, as well as premature adult mortality that is linked to diet related non communicable diseases. And you look at just Uganda it's estimated that about 15% of all child mortality cases are associated with it, undernutrition, and about 54% of the adult population at one point actually uh, we started as children. When we look at the annual, associated annual cost of child undernutrition alone in Uganda, it's estimated to be about 1.8 trillion, okay? Which is equivalent to about 5.6% of the Ugandan GDP. So look at the effect of non-provision of agriculture extension on, on health, okay? So when we looked at the data, what does the data say, okay? Much as um, the data was showing that uh, there was a reduction in stunting and wasting, the results were not significant. And we kept wondering, why are these results not significant? So we looked at uh, access to agriculture extension. Then on top of that, we also looked at the number of visits, okay? So we were able to conclude that probably there was non-significance of these results because of their number of visits. So visiting a farmer just one time is not going to have the same effect as visiting the farmer several times. So probably that's the reason we, we saw uh, these non-significant uh, results. However, we could still see that access here, this is our access to uh, extension. When you look at compared to undernutrition, here there was a decline. When you look at wasting or percentage of children under five, there was a decline. When you look at uh, stunting, that is the percentage of children again for only under five years of age, there was also a decline. When we look at extension, uh, sorry here, under underweight, again the percentage of children who are so they were underweight and uh, they are five years and under. Again, we see there was a general decline. So what can we conclude from this? We can say there is an impact. Provision of agriculture extension um, impacts other sectors of the economy, specifically health. We can see that the children um, have a decline in nutrition, under nourishment, wasting, underweight, etc. Okay. But if we were to look at the actual number of visits, we'd be able to see a much more significant decline in all this. So let's look at zoonosis and the foodborne diseases 
we one of the uh, the things we found out was uh, the we have an act, the Veterinary Act, that had been in existence, but now it is outdated, and um, because of that, actually, uh, there is a policy gap. And we can see from here, this is a study we extracted from Grace et al. and some of the US statistics here. What they are showing us is uh, the different zoonotic diseases that uh, affect human health. Okay, here we have the different diseases, the pathogens or the agents, the transmission, the illness in humans, and human death annually, and humans that are affected annually. Overall, we see that about 500,000 humans are affected annually. Of those, about 25,000 actually die from brucellosis. When you look at anthrax, about 11,000 humans are affected. Of those, about 1,250 actually die from anthrax. When you look at hepatitis E, uh, transmitted by pathogen, hepatitis E virus, we have about 14 million people that are affected out of those 300,000 300, actually died. From gastrointestinal uh, infections, we have about 2 uh, million uh, that actually are affected. Annually, about 1,500,000 people actually die from gastrointestinal infections. And we look at rabies, about 70,000 people are affected annually and um, all, all those that get affected actually die. That is the statistics we're able to pull from another study. Okay, so what does this mean? That in fact, not just focusing on crop, because we saw we can actually, there's an impact of extension on crop, okay, that results into food security agency. But also, there is a negative impact on it, uh, if you don't consider provision of extension services to livestock. This is what can result. Okay, so let's move to uh, what an environment. The results suggest existence of positive relations between AE and emissions, but the results again were not significant. Our explanation was probably the same. The number of visits that uh, uh, this extension workers undertook was not that significant. Again, with the different issues looked at, we extension, uh, burning of crop residues, manure management, synthetic fertilizer use, ETC. Again, same explanation, not significant. When we look at trade and industry, our results suggested that there is a positive relationship between allocation to the local governments and other export earnings, especially the crops that we pulled out were maize, beans, and groundnuts. And uh, what we can see is that the more funds that were allocated to the local government, uh, to <coughs> the NAD secretary, to the district, district level, the more funds that were allocated to extension services, okay? What is the, uh, the trade-off of not investing, not spending this uh, about $18 on a project extension service? Again, we want to look at specifically the health sector. What happens? If there is absence of agrarian extension, it results, of course, we saw in food insecurity among the households. Okay, the data from the Uganda Bureau of Statistics in 2015 showed that about 55 households, uh, percent, past 55 percent of the uh, households consumed. Uh, there was about 55 percent of the food consumed at, house, at household level in Uganda is from own production or given in kind, okay? What does this mean? It implies that about 3.9 million households <coughs> are at a higher risk of starvation if these services are not provided or are not improved upon. But again, if you are to really look at the bigger picture, what is the cost of feeding these households per month? It is estimated to, about, to be about $31 if you're to provide uh, food for a household. So the estimated cost of feeding these households per year if the government does not provide a project extension services is about 5.2 billion Uganda shillings, which translates to about 1.4 million. That is just on the food only if a project extension is lacking. But if you look at the water environment, if you do not provide a project extension, what is the effect it will have on a different sector? 
water and environment. Okay? Already we saw that we, we found that on average about 15.8 billion Uganda shillings was invested in water for the production period of 2005-2006, 2014-2015 physical years. And this translates into about a total investment of 43 million US dollars. Already the government has sunk in, okay, for the physical period 2005-2006, 2014-2015. If we do not just provide this uh, 66,000 uh, Uganda shillings for this uh, extension worker to go down and provide the service, it will lead to failure to invest in extension service. Uh, services will lead to poor utilization of water for production. The farmers will not be able to utilize this water correctly. And what does this mean? The country is going to lose about 43 billion, uh, 43 million US dollars that has already been invested in water uh, by the Ministry of Water and uh, Energy. So it is important that uh, the government considers investing this much on, on an extension. When you look at trade and industry, so according to Uganda National Household Surveys, 2012-2013, about 45% of the foods consumed at household level in Uganda is about is purchased. Remember, 55 was consumed was from home, consumption, home production or in kind, but 45 is purchased. What does this imply? That failure to provide extension services will deprive the market of food that would have been purchased by these households. What does it mean? The expenditure on food at household level, again, remember we estimated it to be at about $31 um, a household. But these 45% households that depend on purchased food, uh, if you are to provide for them, meaning you're going to be spending about $888. That the lack of production resulting from no extension services translates to the government spending about $1.1 million US dollars in making sure that they import food for the, uh, the households. Okay? This implies that the whole country is at risk of spending this much, 2.5 billion, on food importation if the investment in extension services is not provided and improved upon. Okay. What do we conclude from uh, this study? The emerging picture is that agricultural policies generally consider extension as very important. We saw policies have been put in place. Okay, there are a few gaps, but they consider general um, agricultural extension to be important. But the financing for it is very limited. Legislative and political environment does not favor agricultural extension, like I mentioned, that there are no political gains. It is a, uh, a public good, and normally public goods have all these issues. And the other conclusion we can draw is the cost of not investing in such extension is significant, but we do not have concrete research. When we looked at the published literature, referred journals, it was very difficult for us to come up with any studies that had really tried to link such extension to different sectors of the economy. So there is limited research to link such extension to other sectors of the economy, and data generally. Uh, not there, there's a problem with the data. So we had to try and uh, go to different ministries and, and establish their data, and it was quite a, a very difficult to get data. The data was still limited. And we could have done much more if data was available. And much of the attention seems to be focused on input distribution, and yet the level of technology issues is, is still very high. Again, we saw that the farmers uh, were not utilizing uh, the right um, seeds, okay? And of course this is affecting productivity and generates very high costs. So what are some of the recommendations? Policy advocacy. Can we have some of these acts, some of the, uh, the laws that have been uh, outdated? Can we have them uh, worked upon? Uh, we need policy advocacy on the part of the legislators. We need the farmer involvement. Ownership is very important. Because as we saw, the nuts actually collapsed because there was no ownership. Nobody owned it. And then there's increased financial support. There's need for increased financial support under this policy advocacy. So the other recommendation is collaboration. This study was instituted by an NGO, meaning that they have a vested interest. Okay, so 
probably government should try to bring these people forward. Right now, they provide um, the sympathetic social services in isolation. But if you brought on board NGOs and civil society organizations, this would be extremely helpful because they would be able to take these technologies down to the farmers. And also, it's important to link extension officers to research institutions. Right now, you have the the universities and research institutions doing their thing, and once they have developed a hybrid, they simply take it to the uh, to the farmers and say uh, to the extension officers, introduce to the extension officers, who then take it to the farmers. But then the extension officers were not involved all along, so it is important to link them with the research institutions, and of course providing logistical support, which we saw was these other NGOs and CSOs who were very much willing to come on board. Because as we saw, the unit cost of providing uh, extension per visit is very high. Then if you look at the total number of people to receive extension, and if you increase the number of visits, the amount gets uh, so high that the government may not even be able to do that. So if you bring all these people, who are willing partners? So actually that issue will be addressed. There's of course a need for more research in uh, extension linkages, okay? Well, like we said, this, uh, this is one of the few uh, researchers that so far was there uh, we've done and of course we need good methodological designs okay uh, an example we suggested was probably use of randomized code proprios where we, we targeted extension messages from specific sectors to see how will this perform and of course there is need for investment <coughs> in data collection uh, again we saw given that the animal husband has over time been ably provided by the private sector, can we then recommend the private sector to actually continue providing this while government concentrates on regulation? And then a project extension we saw is cutting uh, across different sectors of the economy. Is it now possible? Maybe the government should try to ensure that there is a project extension integration into the different sectors of the economy. And then we recommend utilizing the public-private uh, partnerships model in provision of extension services to ensure that the cost is met by several other people, not just the government that's not able to do that. And if we are just to look at recommendations uh, to specific sectors to reduce negative externalities on health, promote nutrition sensitive <coughs> culture, extension should emphasize uh, volcanic poles that are not very harmful to the environment, to reduce uh, cost of trade, and it should include good agricultural practices, making sure that um, it is acceptable in the international market, farm biodiversity measures and provision of market information, uh, to reduce on cost to the environment, agriculture extension should promote conservation and agricultural technologies, and also promote use of integrated soil fertility management practices, as well as integrated pest management practices. So those are uh, recommendations to specific sectors, what can a project extension now do to make sure that there is limited negative impact to these different uh, sectors of the economy. So that was our study. Thank you so much for your listening. Uh, any questions? Yes. Uh, did you happen to look at uh, like the share of crop, like different crops that are being produced over this time period. I'm curious, did uh, provision of uh, agricultural extension services impact uh, the kinds of crop, crops being produced, and does that have any potential impacts for, um, say, shifting more towards export crops like coffee or, or um, <coughs> and away from, from uh, food consumption crops that might be? Thank you very much, Aiden. Okay, so, Actually, that is one of the, 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 the issues we had, limited data. So the data we had, you'll find there is data for 2004, and there, there was no data that was collected up to again 2008, and then, you know, the data was random and it was collected for different crops at any one time. So it was difficult to follow from this period, time period that we were looking at. You were getting different crops, so it was not easy to say this is uh, how much... Um, of this crop that is produced, and this is how much um, extension work is going to this crop. But one thing that um, we saw was actually that uh, somehow, because of the agro zoning, the country has been zoned now to say, let the eastern part focus on 
uh, animal production because and it is uh, it does well there and fruit production. Okay, let the the central part concentrate on uh, coffee and let the eastern part also parts of the eastern part of the country pro, uh, uh, grow more of the robusta coffee. So that that kind of agrozoning is kind of helping, but we need that to happen. And we can only be able to do that if there's data. At this point, we're not able to do that because of limited data. Yes? So you mentioned that there's a, <coughs> as the public supply of extension has declined, as the private supply has taken that role, mm -hmm. uh, were you able to quantify how much is being spent and on what kind of extension services? Because I'm guessing they aren't the same as the public provided. So these are more financially viable, larger operations, export operations, I'm guessing. Is that true? Very good question. So again, we're not able to exactly do that quantification. There's no data to do that. But um, what <coughs> is happening with, what was happening with the private sector, it was demand driven. The farmer, I'm growing my coffee, I feel like okay, for me to be able to increase my productivity, I need to get knowledge on this, so the farmer would invest his own money in uh, actually hiring this extension worker to come and teach him a specific technology on how to do it. So you find that um, because it was demand-driven, a few farmers were able to access only those who could afford, and yet for the public, if it was provided by the public sector, then a majority of the farmers, whether you can afford to pay or not, would be visited. But uh, Right now, that's why we saw that actually there was a decline in government provision during the private provision of the services by the private sector took up. This, it replaced kind of, but there were very few farmers that were reached and it's only because it was demand driven. Can I pick up on one particular aspect of that? You mentioned aflatoxin, uh -huh. which is a huge problem, not just in developing nations, so here in the US. Um, is there anything else that you can share about that? Because my guess is that could be both an export, but given the private supply, that's probably not the case. This is the local stresses of food insecurity in, in subsistence farming, right? So yeah. Again, is that true? So in a different study, not specifically this one, in a different study, that I was involved in, it was a much on a smaller scale, actually samples were taken <coughs> of, 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 of corn, of groundnuts, uh, taken to the lab, and of millet, sorghum, those are the common staple crops. And those all had aflatoxin. Mm -hmm, yeah. Exactly, they had aflatoxin. Maybe the good thing is that uh, um, it was again, the aflatoxins developed after some time, like they've been in storage exactly for about um, a month plus or three months, that's when they developed that. And uh, when you look at the seasons in Uganda, the farmers really don't store those crops for a long time because there are two seasons. That was the good news. However, if you to look at exporting, because the whole idea is we need to be able to increase our exports to be able to, to get revenue. If you're looking at that, then it is an issue must address, okay? To make sure that uh, uh, they are not contaminated by aflatoxins. So these, sorry, right, but these um, on-farm storage or centralized storage? On-farm, okay. on-farm storage, yes, thank you, yes. Kind of a general question. Um, so just with climate change and the intensity and um, frequency of droughts occurring, and with agricultural and especially here being so dependent on on the weather, um, do you think that really it's the right sector for the government to be investing in for its country? Or like, should it invest in a different sector that maybe isn't so dependent on the weather? Something a little less risky. Mm -hmm. Very good question. So, what's you could look at it too. So, the government is not just investing in agriculture. The government is promoting different other sectors: the tourism sector, the service sector, and at the back of their minds, of course, they say there are issues of climate change that affect agriculture. 
but they are saying we are not going to abandon this completely because over 72 percent of the population is depending on it so what they do now is to provide what they say water for production where they're opening irrigation uh, dams where farmers will be able to get some water to address issues of climate change but yeah they are they're also trying to move towards other sectors, the service sector, the tourism sector, being promoted to address such issues. So at least we find a smaller proportion of the population uh, still involved in agriculture. Then majority of the population being moved into other sectors. I have a question. Yes. Um, so. How many, you, you kept talking about like the number of visits that needed, like what's the average number of visits that a farmer would usually get through either NGO, or I don't know if it's probably different between NGO and government, mm -hmm. um, and, and what do you think is the proper level? That's a very subjective question, but uh, from the data, we actually found that uh, on average, the farmers were visited twice per season, which is, which is I mean, how much can you get in one visit, somebody comes maybe for two hours, another visit, another two hours. Uh, that's not enough. So, but on average, the data uh, was showing that uh, there are about two visits uh, per farmer. But we think if we're to put a number there, we think per, per season, a farmer should not be visited less than 10 times. Wait, sorry. But they, they oh, sorry. Which, which data set are you saying that shows two visits per farmer? We use the UBOS data, um, uh, the data from Uganda Bureau of Statistics that was uh, collected over panel data, the UN, UNPS, mm -hmm. Uganda National Panel Surveys, that was showing about two visits. Yeah. But is there crop rotation common there? I mean, why? I mean, that's two visits per year. 10 visits per year sounds like a lot. A season. Oh. So do, how for, are they single system agriculture? Are they, are they changing so crops it, every season? Are they? So it depends again on uh, the acreage a farmer has. So most of the time we're looking at small scale farmers. They really own less than about two, two acres of land. So you find that the farmer does a lot of intercropping. There's a legume there, there's a cereal there to be able to <coughs> maximize the output from this. And this is in one season, then the next season comes, then he again does something else. But most of the time they are, they are intercropped. Okay, so now the idea of, actually what he had, the question he had asked earlier, comes in. Maybe we should be looking at more of commercial crops than simply subsistence crops. But there's a limitation of all now these farm sizes that we're looking at, the really small farm sizes. So we are saying, okay, let's see how we can maximize production from these small acreages of land. Maybe if we, if we provide more of these extension services, okay, not only are we going to increase productivity, but we might also be able to, yes. So I just, so I also work with the, the LSMS data yes. and the previous Yobo data. I just pulled up the 2000, the, the latest round of the data in 2013. Mm -hmm. And in 2013, 96% of farmers said that they did not have an extension visit. And 3.8% of farmers said they did have an extension data, which is consistent with what I remember. Like I've never explicitly said an extension in the LSMS data. Mm -hmm. I have a different data set that I collected, also a panel from 2000. 2013. And what I've always seen is that extension is like, you know, at 5% tops in any time period in any part of Uganda. So I'm sure that you're referring to like a real variable, but I just think you must be talking about a different type of extension or like in the LSMS just they less ask about things like extension, government, local, whatever, they wrote a whole bunch. and. The, People say yes to any of those only 3% of the time. Mm -hmm. so you must be talking about some other very, what, why, why is there this difference? What are you talking about that's getting to people twice a season? Well, we are actually looking at access to extension. 
You're services. You're actually looking at whether they have an extension worker coming. You're looking at a measure of whether they believe they have access to the extension worker. So both, or actually combined, initially we're looking at just access, do you have an extension worker coming here, okay? And then did you actually, did you receive a service from an extension worker? So initially when we looked at, did you receive a service from an, an extension worker, then of course the results that you're saying, actually, uh, then those are right results. But when you look at just accessibility, did you receive, and does an extension worker come to this area? Yes, so we combined those two to make that variable. But when you disaggregate, then the very few people receive the extension. Yeah, I mean, I, I would be very distrustful of, a, of any variable that showed that the majority of people could, if they wanted, access extension twice a season. I think the vast majority of the non farmers, if they wanted to, if they really wanted someone to come two times, mm -hmm. they could not get an extension worker two times to come to their farm. Mm -hmm. Like most of the farmers, if you ask them, can you really get a guy to come twice in one season, they would say, like, no way, that guy's not going to come two times in one season. I can't even get him to come once. You see, uh, that's, uh, uh, that is true. Look at what is going on right now. Yeah. Only 12% of the farmers have access as it is right now. There are about 1,200 extension officers. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that number is really small. And that is why now the new policy for extension is saying, can we increase the ratio to, from 1 to one to 5,000 to 1 to 500? So if we are able to do that, then we can have probably more, more visits a household by an extension worker. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was kind of my question. I was wondering, I'm curious as how extension is structured there. I mean, knowing how it's structured here mm -hmm. through the College of Food and Ag and Environmental Sciences, and there's regional offices, and you can you know tap into resources in other areas. And obviously, it's different. We have different transportation and different things. Mm -hmm. But um, so, what is what is the structure? I'm curious. Okay, so uh, initially from around uh, 2004 5, we had a movement from train and visit to uh, NADS, the NADS uh, program that is National Agriculture Advisory Services, where it was supposed to be demand driven. The farmer would say, I need this service, and then uh, procure us that service from the extension worker. But there was a public outcry, a few people were being reached, and they just model farmers. And uh, whenever the government would try to come in, they would use model farmers. And um, it's only those farmers that could afford to pay for this service that could get it. The majority of the farmers were not receiving the service at all. So, because of that public outcry, there was, uh, there was re trying to realign. And remember again, uh, we have different people who have interest, vested interest in providing this service. Okay, the, like I said, the NGOs and uh, civil society organizations. So the government said, no, we need to take charge again. And they came up with a single spine extension system where all those who would like to provide extension services, they need to come under the Ministry of Agriculture and, uh, and Animal Industry. Okay? So under that, what it's supposed to do is to hire more of the extension workers, increase this number. Okay? From 1,200 increase because they, I mean the universities are generating uh, uh, casual, you know, uh, students graduating every year, but they don't have jobs. They're just in the streets doing other things. So why not hire this as in the single extension system? The Ministry of Agriculture is going to hire them and then send them to different sub counties where they'll be able to, they'll be stationed and providing extension services. That's now the new model that they are trying to come up with. They've really come up with now. In fact, the whole of 2017 was supposed to be for capacity building, retooling and reskilling these extension workers so that they are able now to provide that service. Yes. Uh, we're out of time. Thank you very much, Dr. Soto, for your presentation.